Let's explore today just who were the Founding Fathers and what did they stand for? Now we always use this phrase, the Founding Fathers, but it really refers to the 55 white men who appeared in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania between May of 1787 and September and hammered out the Constitution of the United States that we have been using ever since. So we speak of the founders in a, in a larger way to include people like Thomas Jefferson and so on, but the founding fathers in a technical sense were those 55 men chosen from 13 states. One state did not attend. Rhode Island refused to attend the Constitutional Convention, but the other 12 were there, and, and those 12 states in different fashions had selected these 55 delegates. This wasn't our first Constitution. This was not the first shot we'd taken at it. <laughs> You're absolutely right. We had the Articles of Confederation, which were cobbled together during the war. They were a really weak Constitution. Basically, they were a, a set of protocols by which 13 highly individualistic states could, could agree on certain procedures to prosecute the war and have something like a national government during this time of emergency. But they didn't, they didn't create a union. It was a confederation of states. There was no real president. There was a president pro tem who served for one year only. There was no judiciary. What was ludicrous about it, Sam, is that it had no enforcement power. So it actually had to requisition tax monies from the states. It would say, Virginia, we think you should give us a million dollars. North Carolina, <laughs> we think you should give us $800,000. The states would either comply or not, but there was no compulsion. There was no enforcement power by the national government. And so uh, George Washington despaired throughout uh, the war, particularly at Valley Forge, when he couldn't get materiel from Congress. He couldn't get funding. They wouldn't help him with troops. They couldn't supply lead and gunpowder and muskets. So you have this sort of haphazard club of states that do not want to join together. And that had gotten us from 1775 through the end of the war and a little beyond. But it had really begun to show signs of uh, feebleness. And everybody knew that we needed something a little bit stronger. The question was, how much? And so one of the ironies of this is that the Constitutional Convention of 1787 was empowered by the states not to create a new constitution. They were empowered merely, it says, for the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation. The idea was the delegates would go to Philadelphia and they would tinker a little with this thing to give it more fiscal authority and a little bit more central power, and that would be it. There would just be a few minor adjustments. The first thing they did in Philadelphia was to throw the Articles of Confederation out the window and replace it with an almost infinitely more powerful constitution. That's why it had such a difficult time getting ratified, because nobody had expected this to happen. What was Shays' Rebellion? Shays' Rebellion is one of the precipitating events of the Constitutional Convention. There was a lot of financial dislocation after the war. And uh, people had neglected their farms, and there were, the currency had inflated, and the, the, every state had a different style of money, and the monies didn't really overlap, and you know, there was just a mess. And in western Massachusetts, these farmers, many of whom were veterans and war heroes, were being foreclosed upon, not because they were bad farmers, but because the economy was so out of whack. And so finally, they asked the legislature in Salem to, to fix things, and the legislature didn't. So led by a Revolutionary War captain by the name of Daniel Shays, a group of farmers sort of rose up with their pitchforks and muskets, and they marched on the, on the, uh, the arsenal at Springfield, and they stopped some foreclosures, and they closed some courts, and intimidated some judges and bankers. And that created a national panic. George Washington thought that this was pandemonium and the, the rise of mobocracy, and, and Abigail Adams denounced this as the worst sort of atheism. And, and anarchy. Jefferson, over in France, said in a famous letter, you know, I, I like a little rebellion now and then. It's not so bad to have a little rebellion. It sort of reminds government of what's at stake. But the, the Founding Fathers panicked. And so when they went to Philadelphia to do these tiny little adjustments on the Articles of Confederation, foremost in their mind was, how do we create a government strong enough to put down rebellions just like that, or even better, to be strong enough so that those rebellions will be intimidated and not even begin. 
Why do we call Madison the father of the Constitution? This is such a, a great story. Madison is from Virginia. He's a very, very shy man. He's a small man. He is pallid. He thinks he's an epileptic. He's a hypochondriac, but he's brilliant. He's, he's absolutely the most intellectually penetrating and brilliant of all of the founding fathers. And as you know, that's a, a pretty big statement. It's a big statement because this is a cluster of genius. He's more brilliant than Jefferson. He's a better scholar by far than Jefferson and a much more realistic political thinker. So he's one of those people who is despairing over the Articles of Confederation. And he's part of a group uh, led by Alexander Hamilton that are calling for this national meeting. Madison, who's already Jefferson's closest friend, writes to his friend Jefferson in Paris and says, we don't know what we're doing. This has never been done before. We're, we're at sea. What are we going to do? How do we, how do we create a new constitution? And Jefferson, in a typical Jeffersonian moment, writes back and says, look, you have to read all these books. I'll send them to you. So Jefferson sends Madison more than 80 books and says, read these and you'll know what to do. And it's, it's the history of liberty and the history of law and the history of international relations and the history of contract. And Madison dutifully reads them all. He prepares and he writes these memos, sort of the vices of constitutions and the possibilities of constitutions. And so that's what's called a brief or a commonplace book. And Madison exhausts the subject. And so when they get to the Constitutional Convention, everyone else just shows up, you know, like, oh, we'll talk and we'll make a few adjustments. Madison comes loaded with information and ideas. And he got there before everybody else, and he was with this seven-member Virginia delegation, and he had meetings with them in which he convinced them that he had this idea of how the new Constitution should look. He was not going to revise the articles. So he talks the governor, Edmund Randolph, into presenting on the first real day of deliberations, something called the Virginia Plan, which is really the Madison Plan, but Madison is too shy to do it himself, he gives it to Governor Edmund Randolph, and Randolph stands up and says, A, we're not going to revise the articles, and B, here's a really interesting plan for a strong central government. That caught everyone by surprise, and the rest of the Constitutional Convention had to fall into the structure and the modeling and the, the template that Madison had provided. So the Constitution is not the one he wanted, but it's more his than any other single person, thanks to his unbelievable intellectual preparation. So the bottom line is, if you want to control a constitutional convention, do your homework. Absolutely. You know, Jefferson and Madison shared one extremely important quality, and this is one of the great qualities of leadership, Sam. They were always the best prepared person in any room they ever went into. The person who's prepared usually wins the day. The other people have to react now, and in reacting, they have to acknowledge the template that they're reacting to. And so Madison, by the sheer doggedness of his intellectual preparation, won the day. And we owe to him the fact that we have a very strong, uh, vital, living, dynamic constitution, because some of the other people who came just wanted to tinker a little with this and that and go back home. Here's a few questions to think about and discuss. Question one, why did the Founding Fathers regard the Articles of Confederation as so inadequate? What were the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation? Question two, why didn't Thomas Jefferson and John Adams attend the Constitutional Convention? Question three, why was George Washington selected as the presiding officer at the Constitutional Convention? Question four, only white males attended the convention. Does this undermine its authority in the 21st century? Question five, the founding fathers wrestled with the idea of slavery, but did nothing to stop the practice. Why? They deliberated for a long time, but who actually wrote this thing? You know, it's a great question because there were 55 men. They're hammering out compromise after compromise, and the way they set it up is that they often devolved into something called the Committee of the Whole, which sort of means you can talk about anything you want and you can make provisional votes, but they won't be recorded and you can change your mind later. And it's designed, it's a parliamentary procedural design to allow maximum freedom of discussion. So you can't follow the presidency through the Constitution or Congress through the Constitution or the, or the Bill of Rights through the Constitution because they just appear all over the place in little glistening fragments. So by the time they finally got this thing all hammered out, they, then somebody had to actually you know, produce 
a written constitution. And Gouverneur Morris, that's his actual name, Gouverneur Morris, has one leg. He's a famous ladies' man. He's a deep cynic who's been schooled in Europe. He gets the assignment to write the language which we still have uh, 220 and more years later. It's his document, but of course, he's writing on behalf of this large cluster of geniuses, 55 of them. And the first paragraph is his. They never, they never said, oh, let's have a really noble preamble. That's sort of what you would expect of Thomas Jefferson rather than these hard-headed, practical men of self-interest at the Constitutional Convention. But Gouverneur Morris provided this. There was a time, Sam, when every school child in this country had to memorize this statement. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. And let me just stop to parse that in a couple of quick ways. Number one, we the people of the United States, not we the people of North Carolina, Georgia, New Jersey, New Hampshire, Delaware. The Constitution leaped over the states, which were the Articles of Confederation, and took its sovereignty, its legitimacy from the people. We the people of the United States. Very clever. The Anti-Federalists immediately realized <laughs> this, and this became a, a big contest ground during the ratification struggle. In, or, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, assure domestic tranquility, there's Shays' Rebellion for you, provide for the common defense, and then this, promote the general welfare. Now that was probably just a throwaway statement, the way you would if you were prefacing bylaws, but there has been almost more Supreme Court deliberation over the meaning of general welfare than any other clause in the Constitution, that that clause has become just a a kind of almost a universal elixir for constitutional activity. If Gouverneur Morris knew that, he probably wouldn't have written it. And secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish the people, now launch the new United States of America. So this is a very important sentence in addition to being a beautifully written one. The styling of the Constitution is amongst the greatest of all constitutions in the world, and that really is the work of this not-so-well-known man, Gouverneur Morris of Pennsylvania. Remarkable. Um, talk a little bit more about uh, Jefferson and the secrecy that was going on at the time. Well, Jefferson is a born Constitution maker. You know, when people, somebody would write to Jefferson and say, uh, I'm thinking of uh, getting, going to law school, what should I read? And then Jefferson would just delight and send them a list of books they should read and what hours of the day they should do it. Jefferson's always telling people how to live their lives in a benign way and making lists and making charts. And he'd, he was just sort of born for, to live with Microsoft Excel, you know, <laughs> sorting, charting, prioritizing. And, and Jefferson is a born constitution maker. He wrote a draft constitution for Virginia on several occasions. This is just his cup of tea. He wasn't there. Why? He was serving as the American ambassador to France. John Adams not only was one of the principal authors of the Massachusetts Constitution, but he wrote endlessly about constitutions. In fact, his brand new, almost unreadable tome, Defense of the United States Constitutions, was published just before this event occurred in Philadelphia, and each member of Congress got one. You know, They were supposed to follow the genius of John Adams, but he was gone. He was in Europe serving as the American ambassador to England. So theoretically, the two most extraordinary men in America, when you need a constitution written, were absent. And they couldn't help. Jefferson helped in the one little way that he did by sending a bibliography to poor Madison and sending them the books too, and then charging him for them. But John Adams helped in writing this treatise on the constitution, but neither one of them was consulted directly, partly because there was a secrecy rule. The first thing the founding fathers did when they got into the state house, you know, the famous Independence Hall, we now call it, was design a gag rule. And they said, look, we're not going to be able to do this if uh, what we're doing leaks out to the public. Uh, then we're going to have interest groups, and they're going to have angry mobs, and people are going to be uh, complaining that you didn't represent their interests carefully. If we want a really free-flowing, honest, and candid dialogue about the future of this country, the only way we can possibly do it is to do it secretly. So they do this secrecy rule, and it 
the most amazing thing of all, Sam, was that the delegates honored it. Nobody leaked information. Even Madison, to his closest friend and confidant, Jefferson, would not discuss in his letters what was going on within those closed doors. There was one breach of secrecy, a document uh, of the Virginia plan, uh, somehow got left on the street, and George Washington got it. And Washington was, was the president of the Constitutional Convention, and he came in in his kind of serene, monarchical way, and he said, I don't know, one of you left this uh, somewhere, and it's, I picked it up on the street. Whoever it is, come and pick it up. And that person never came forward because you don't want the anger of George Washington. And after that, no one dared to leak anything. The security was completely tight. We, Jefferson, when he heard about that, said, wait a minute. You're trying to create a new social compact for an open democratic society in which freedom matters to you more than any other single issue, and you do it with a gag rule? And he said, this doesn't bode very well for the very, you know, he was sort of saying, the process is the product. But Madison and the others were shrewd. They knew that they needed the secrecy in order to pull this off. And just for a moment, Sam, imagine if we had a constitutional convention today, how much would leak out of that process. It's, we, we know that today the self-restraint just isn't there. Well, plus, um, in the 21st century, the idea of a smoke-filled back room would be abhorrent. <laughs> but try, imagine how else you could do this. I mean, imagine, just for a moment, trying to create a constitution for the 21st century. CNN, the internet, people leaking stuff, YouTube, um, you know, Star Magazine paying you a, a million dollars for a cell phone photograph of George Washington at the presiding table. We live in an age of such scrutiny and such ubiquitous media that it's, I mean, we can probably conceive of a circumstance under which we could do this, but it's pretty hard. It sounds like a fairy tale now. Here are some more discussion questions. Question six. The Constitutional Convention worked behind closed doors with a code of secrecy. Why would the Founding Fathers have done that? Question seven. How did James Madison prepare for the Constitutional Convention? Question eight. The Virginia Plan, proposed by James Madison, envisioned a government much more powerful than anything Jefferson could have admired. Why did Madison propose a form of government his closest friend would have resisted? Question nine. The Constitutional Convention nearly broke down on several occasions. What were the fundamental disagreements? Question 10. Benjamin Franklin was at the Constitutional Convention, but he didn't say much, yet he is considered a principal participant. Why? I was curious, what did Benjamin Franklin say at the end of the convention? You know, this is one of the great moments of the Constitution. Franklin was 81 years old, and he, everyone realized that he was a universal genius and that he was the world's first international celebrity. And he, there was a cult of Franklin in France. And this really made a lot of people feel nauseous. I mean, John Adams couldn't stand the cult of Franklin, and he thought he was a big show-off. And if you, if Franklin can never, can never answer a question, so you say to Franklin, uh, what should we do about the Electoral College? And then you get this endless story about something he saw in a bread market in Paris. And so he's a little doddering and he's a little tedious, but he's also a genius and his health is no good. So he's being carried to the Constitutional Convention every day in a litter chair. And he's the, he dresses down and has this greasy hair. And he, he, this, he's an amazing human being, but he also was kind of a pain in the ass by the time this all happened. He had two great moments, though, at the Constitutional Convention. One was when they were at a big impasse, when they, when they looked like the small states were going to walk out because of the big state, small state controversy. Franklin one morning said, you know, I've been around for a long time, and I've seldom seen this much tension. I think we should get a chaplain and pray every morning before our deliberations. No one seconded, seconded the motion. Um, Franklin, the last person you would expect to propose prayer, proposes this idea, and no one will second it. And Hamilton has said, is said to have said, we don't need foreign help, which is too cynical even for, <laughs> even for Hamilton. Well, then at the end of the, at the Constitutional Convention, Franklin, this kind of storyteller, he says, well, you know, this whole time I've been sitting here looking at the chair that George Washington's sitting in. And on the wood at the back of that chair is a sun that's partly in and partly out of the ocean. 
He said, all this time I've been sitting here wondering if that sun is setting or if that sun is rising. He says, now I believe I can say with some pride that that sun is rising. It's just like a quintessential Ben Franklin story. That's what he was the greatest in the world at, is taking that little piece of trivia and turning it into a parable that somehow made everyone feel better. Remember he had said during the revolution, we must all hang together or we will assuredly hang separately. You know, that's the capacity of, of Ben Franklin. Tell us other great moments. That was one great moment, the end when he said that, and of course the prayer. Another one was July 16th and 17th, the Great Compromise. That's when the big states and the little states finally realized there can be no constitution unless we split the difference. So the big states, which were much more populous than the little states and much wealthier, reluctantly agreed that in the Senate there could be two senators from every state, no matter how big or small. And in the House there would be something like proportional representation. The big states did not want this. They saw it as fundamentally unfair, which it is. But the little states were not going to join the Constitution unless they got that parity, that equality in the Senate. When that happened, the moment they agreed to this compromise, all of the tension just floated out of the room and the rest of the process was simple. But to make a point though, it was unfair to the big states, but it was very fair to the smaller states to give them adequate representation. Well, yes and no. Uh, you know, if you think today that a, a, a treaty in the United States Senate has to be passed by two-thirds of its members, that's 67. 67 from 100 is 23. So 23 senators, you know, what's that? Um, 12 states? 12 states can hold up the business of a nation of 300 million. The 12 smallest states, North Dakota, Vermont, Delaware, New Hampshire, Wyoming, Alaska, their total population base is maybe 20 million. Those 20 million can hold up the whole country. It's not democratic. It may be an important compromise, but it's certainly not democratic. And when people argue today about what's wrong with our Constitution, they almost invariably go to that rule in the Senate. You from Nevada, I from North Dakota are thrilled that we get parity in the Senate. Otherwise, it's hard to even believe we would still exist. But the big states hated it, and it does violate that most sacred of democratic principles, one man, one vote. A North Dakotan, through their senators, has much more power. In fact, every North Dakotan equals 53 Californians with respect to senatorial representation. Is that fair? Depends on who you ask. And where you live. One more. Ju June 18th, this is sort of my favorite. On June 18th, Alexander Hamilton, who after Madison was by far and away the most brilliant man there, but he's this maverick and he's a womanizer and he's a hothead and he fights duels and he's a, he's a really odd human being, but someone that's kind of breathtaking in his charisma. He stands up on June 18th and he says, I, I, I'm a little shy about this, but I'd like to give my own vision of what this country should be. He gave a six-hour speech. <laughs> That's not that uncommon, five, six-hour speeches, but he gave a six-hour speech and he outlined Mr. Hamilton's ideal America. Let me give you the highlights. President who serves for life. Senators serve for life. Governors of individual states appointed by the national executive. The national president to have an absolute veto over acts of the Congress, and the national government to have an absolute veto over acts of the individual states. He said, the people, they are a rabble, incapable of good sense. They must be governed by the wise, the rich, and the well-born. And he even squinted at hereditary monarchy. He said, I know you won't go for this, but if you would really follow good sense, hereditary monarchy. In giving that speech on June 18, 1787, Alexander Hamilton effectively destroyed his career because for the rest of his life, whenever the Jeffersonians wanted to beat up on him, they just had to say, oh, let me remind you of some of the things that you argued for at the Constitutional Convention. And Hamilton would later say, well, it was kind of like a trial balloon and I wasn't really meaning it in earnest. I was just trying to shift the, the discourse a little bit. But this haunted him, and the people understood that he was not a, a Democrat, not even a small-R Republican, and Hamilton was never fully trusted by the American people after this extraordinary outburst. No one said a single thing after he gave the speech. Everyone left in stunned silence. He left a week later and barely ever came back. And so Hamilton was a genius. Jefferson even called him a colossus. 
but Hamilton had the capacity to shoot himself in the foot. And he did it over and over and over again in his life. And as you know, he eventually let himself be drawn into a duel that he didn't believe in and didn't want to fight and was killed in July of 1804 by Aaron Burr. So what shall we conclude from all of this? It wasn't representative, no women, no African Americans, uh, no Indians, uh, no uh, very poor people. It was really the property owners and the privileged elites. They were sort of doing something that was extra constitutional. They had been specifically empowered to make a few little adjustments on the Articles of Confederation. They threw it out and built something much more strong and powerful. They had a very rough time getting this thing ratified because the people of the United States were not eager to move that far towards strong nationalism. And so the ratification process was troubled, and a lot of it was done with some finesse, let's call it, to sort of sneak it in before the people could really rise in opposition. The people, though, in their genius said, we'll do it. We'll hold our nose and ratify this thing, but you have to give us a Bill of Rights. And though the, the Founding Fathers had not created a Bill of Rights in the Constitution, thanks to Madison, they met that promise. And in the first Congress of the United States, Madison introduced the amendments, which, which we know as the Bill of Rights. For all of that, even though if there had been a real plebiscite in 1770, even though if there had been a real plebiscite in 1787, the Constitution would not have been ratified by the American people. It went on to become the most stable, dynamic and profound document in the history of government, and it continues to enable America to be this extraordinary place in the 21st century. So I think we say all hail to the Founding Fathers and particularly to the great Madison. <laughs>